for this debate, we're, we're thinking of a fairly free form structure. Like we came up with a sort of outline of, of what it would be interesting to talk about, which is basically like what is what's going to what, what do we expect to happen over the next few years? Essentially, like it feels like this is a very um, there's a lot of stuff going on this, in this sort of spiking neural network space. There's a lot of different directions, a lot of things people are trying. It all seems quite exciting. And it'd be interesting just basically to hear what people think is going to be the big breakthroughs over the next few years. And so I sort of thinking about two sort of time scales there, like what are we going to be talking about this time next year at this workshop, if we have it again next year, which I hope we will. And maybe what we're going to see in the next five years, like hopefully a bit more dramatic changes. And I think two different angles we can talk about it, one more from the sort of neuroscience side and one more from the neuromorphic computing side. And I think we're going to see some, some pretty interesting um, stuff in both of those angles. I thought a really nice place to start uh, would be actually sort of following up something that came up in, in Henning's talk earlier and also in, in Viola's a bit is um, basically uh, about the EI balance. Like this, this is a point that seems to come up a couple of times. Um, do you want to speculate about why why it should be there? Like, is this is this significant? Like, Hanning, do you want to kick us off? Give you give us your thoughts on this. Yeah, it's something. I mean, I've, I've been trying to think about that quite for quite some time because I mean, I mean, we started thinking about that stuff what freedom on like 10, 12 years ago or something like that. It's been a while, right? <clears throat> so it's 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 something where I don't I still don't quite know why it's there. There are all the obvious arguments why it should not be there. Right. Things like energy efficiency sucks. Um, why should you step on the brake and the gas at the same time? Um, there's enough reasons just not to do it. Right? Um, the, the, I think there are two arguments for me that, that I can buy. One is uh, basically coming from the idea of predictive coding, where you know if you have something, if you say you have external data that are coming in and you have an internal model of the world, and the thing that you're really interested in is how wrong the, how wrong you are in your predictions. Then ultimately, what you have to do is calculate a subtraction. Right? You just have to subtract A from B. And that, if if you think about that neurally, that would be excitation minus inhibition. Right? And so, in the end, then in that picture, excitation inhibition might just be a hallmark of a good world model. Right? Just a world model that works most of the time, and then you know nothing should happen. Meaning excitation should be cancelled by inhibition. So that's one picture that I can kind of buy. And that comes then, you know, as I said, then, then EI balance is not the argument, right? It's not the thing that you're really trying to do as, as, a, as, as a purpose per se, but it's something that results from some other purpose, which in that case would be build the best possible prediction machine. Um, so that's, that's an argument that I can buy. Um, there's another one that, we're, that I'm thinking about quite a bit at the moment, um, which is the question of, um, of modulation. <clears throat> How do I describe that best? Um, if you have some kind of processing pipeline that projects stuff from A to B, and if you want to effectively change how that processing works, then um, typically the idea is that modulation just performs some kind of weak gain modulation, right? If you look at, say, attentional effects or so on the neural level, maybe you get 20% 20, 20 increase in the firing rates or so, but that's really moderate. So if, if I would only look at say the population vector, then it might rotate a bit, but like maybe a few degrees or so, right? And that's just not a lot. Um, but what can make it a lot is if downstream you compute not just the population vector, but the difference in the population vector somehow. Right? And that basically means you're subtracting two things. And at that point, small changes upstream can generate massive changes downstream. And that's something that I think is much more effective when you talk about excitation inhibition balance. So as a default state on which you can then modulate. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody else has more suggestions why it could be there. But my take is not that it's, that it's something that's there per se. It's something that emerges from function. And I guess there's a rich set of functions that could, could occur. And I mean, any function I think that you will compute will either generate correlated ENI or it would generate anti-correlated ENI. And for some reason, for a lot of tasks, they're correlated. Um, that's kind of my, my, my take here. But maybe I'll pass on. Cool. Dylan, yeah, let's say you have something to say. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this is going back a few years for me, but um, uh, when we were looking at um, recurrent excitatory and recurrent inhibitory uh, feedback and patterns of connectivity in, in V1, what we found is that if you had, um, uh, if you're using recurrent excitation to build selectivity, local selectivity, by having structured recurrent excit excitatory feedback, uh, selective excitatory feedback, you very quickly become unstable, obviously, and you need inhibition to balance this. And if you balance it with selective inhibition, your excitatory selectivity can be much more sharp. Uh, so there, there you've got a difference between if you just want to do things with recurrent excitation, you have to make sure that you stay stable. Uh, but if you permit yourself to, to offset the recurrent excitation with inhibitory, selective inhibitory feedback, you, you can become much more selective uh, with the recurrent excitation. That's, that's one other take on it. Maybe I can comment on that as sort of a, a, a sort of almost inhibition fetishist, right? So I think excitation alone can't do anything. Sounds very stupid, but the issue is that if you sum over many excitatory things, you just won't get very far. You, you have the law of large numbers is against you, right? If you just sum things that are all positive, you'll have to divide at some point to make it you know, finite. And then you just run into something that is just all the same. It's all the same mush. And now if you go ahead and you put inhibition into the game, And, and the other thing is that disynaptic or trisynaptic interactions in a purely excitatory network are boring. They're still excitatory. Right? If you have an inhibitory network, then two synapses down the road, you're excitatory. You're in your disinhibitory. Three synapses down the road, you're inhibitory again. So if I think my, my gut feeling would be that you can do arbitrary computations with a purely inhibitory network. But if you take a purely excitatory network, you can't. But that's just, you know, positing it out there. So that's... So just a short follow-up, sorry for grabbing stage again. Yeah, that's, that's a quite a cool idea. Let me, let me give my, my sort of like negative version of the answer to this, which is maybe wrong, which is maybe what we are in a situation where there's like a bunch of equivalent sort of somehow mathematical principles. And we could take any one of them as our starting point. And because they're all in some sense equivalent, any one of them will give rise to training a useful system. And so the fact that any particular one works as a way of training the system as a sort of principle for it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the real reason why, why it's important or something like that. I, I, I don't know. Is, is that potentially applicable here? Or? I think a strong argument would be that if a particular system does not work, it's yeah. a good argument that the other one should be there, right? Mm. And I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen any deep network that's purely excitatory. Has anybody tried? Yeah, I'm sure it will work. I mean, um, this is also not really the question, right? The, the question is really not whether inhibition is important. I think we can all agree that you need some negative computation somewhere. But I think the balance in biology that we've been looking at for a long time seems a little bit more peculiar than just being there for a negative sign. But this co tuning in time and the space that hanging should. And also, Viola. Basically, I'm not sure whether she's around, but she gave a no. use for it, right, to, to decorrelate things, which I think is also what Henning was alluding to, where it's obviously important that not everything becomes the same. The law of large numbers works against you. Um, but maybe to come back a little bit to the question that Ben raised in the beginning, so what, what would it be for the people who are interested in these questions, what would it be uh, what you would like to see in this direction next year? Um, what kind of understanding, or what would even constitute an understanding of balance in that sense? Who wants to comment? <laughs> Everybody's like, <laughs> I mean, you have to leave early, so please. I have to. <laughs> Or if you want, you can answer the more general question that we started with, like, what, what do you think is going to be the big development over the next one year, five years? And, and feel free to, like, stick your neck out wildly and speculate insanely. Like, that would be, make it much more fun. I think there have been super exciting developments over the last five years that we can happily harness and just, you know, harvest. That's, that's one thing that I certainly expect that there will be a lot of harvesting because, I mean, it just, I mean we had that just before... 
the meeting Friedemann, right? Like 10 years ago, you know, I still co- authored a paper where I derived a gradient, right? And now we have all that autograd and, and, and basically we, just, we can just optimize anything that doesn't climb the tree quickly enough, right? And that's, that's, that's an amazing development because it basically allows us to operate things, you know, to optimize things that we just couldn't optimize 10 years ago or five, even five years ago. And that's amazing for me from the, neuro, from the neuroscience perspective because it basically now allows us to take circuits, look, make them look like the brain, like put in biological constraints, and then not just be killed by the complexity we've generated, but then go ahead and train them and actually make them do something, right? And that's something that sort of builds the bridge between sort of normative and phenomenological modeling, which I think is super exciting. And, um, and it's something that, I mean, we've, we've used that quite a bit and it's basically the foundation of everything that we do by now. Um, and I think there's just so much room to explore that I think there's just, that's, that's what I'm just excited to see where that's going to lead for now. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's, it's really going to take off. I think that the, the methods are in place now to make this really explode. Exactly. Um, Sando, I think you had your hand raised first. Yeah, so, so thinking along those lines, I, I have high hopes now for, for hardware, our, our SNN accelerators. I know there's people in the audience uh, like Jamie Knight also working hard to make the, the GPUs really do machine learning style SNNs or learning style SNNs. And then I think that might really start making a difference. We, don't, we, we won't have to uh, wait all the time for our networks to train so we can start scaling them up and, and then probably people will start making bigger chips so we can build bigger networks and you get the whole flywheel going. And, and, and I think that's something I'm looking forward to, really looking forward to. Cool. Casey, do you, do you want to come in on that or, or on a different point? No, I, I was going to agree completely with Sander on the, the aspect of hardware playing a huge role in being able to accelerate what we can do. I, I've been saying for the last couple of years that I feel like we're waiting for neuromorphic to do for spiking neural networks what GPUs did for deep learning. And I think we're finally starting to get to that point. And the, the other point that I wanted to make that I think that gets to what this community is is pushing for is the rise of applications specifically that spiking neural networks can demo on. So benchmarks and metrics, they go around those. And, and I think there is increasingly more and more in that direction that's coming out with the communities releasing different data sets and, and simulation environments and problem sets. I think that's going to be the, the biggest thing we're going to be talking about next year is the, the confluence of the hardware and the applications. Cool. Jamie, do you, do you want to come in on that as well as, a, as another hardware guy? Sure. So my this is going to be my five year my five year point. I, so I I think just put my neck out because physicists have been saying this will happen for some time that like memoristors and resistive resistive memory is going to mean that we can build neuromorphic hardware in five years time, which will actually be able to solve large problems. Um, there'll be enough space for enough synapses to represent large scale networks and start like solving things that aren't sort of a handful of neurons. Cool. Uh, Sim Bamford, do you want to come in? Sure, thanks. Well, here's a question. Um, I mean, I was dismayed to hear from Viola's talk, was it, that there, there is a vanishing spike problem? Because I, I was sort of naively assuming that vanishing spikes were a solution, right? In the sense that if, you, um, if you're creating an edge device and you want to do some, uh, if you want to do some feature um, production before you send data off the device, what you want at the end is less spikes. Um, but it seems at least for learning that that's um, not not where people are going. So does, can anyone comment on that issue? Does anyone want to come back on that? I think probably the people with raised hands were, were thinking about the other points. I don't know if any of yeah, you would also be able to answer that question, I imagine. Uh, my comment would be... Um, it's not, uh, well, if you don't have any spikes, it's clear problems. You can't learn anything. If there's no activity in the network, then you, you struggle to learn anything. Uh, and the example that was shown was uh, with some sort of pathological situation where you had bursts of spikes just propagating through the network with every neuron spiking in every layer and then periods of silence. 
that, that's clearly some pathological state for a network that, that's not encoding uh, a lot of information in a useful way. And so somewhere in between, I think, is, uh, as sparse as possible, but still with some activity encoding some information would be my take on it. Um, I, if, if I can hit on the five-year thing, so what I would hope to see, I don't know if this happens in 12 months or in five years' time, I want to see uh, I want to see this whole field going mainstream. So I, I, I want to see posts on the machine learning subreddit um, where standard machine learning developers are picking up all of the amazing libraries that we have now for doing machine learning with spiky networks and, and building things on them. New developers coming in from outside the, the subfield. Do you think that's going to happen? I mean, in, in, imminently or? Uh, five, within five years, 100%. Within 12 months, not sure. Cool. I'm, I'm sort of slightly terrified about what happens when like Google starts doing spiky neural networks and puts like hundreds of millions of dollars into it and none of us can possibly compete anymore. Oh, well, but, uh, so I, I would, then uh, maybe you should aim to cash out in five years. <laughs> <laughs> um. Cool. I think, uh, so is it Lies? You had your uh, hands up for a little while? Yeah, it's, uh, so it's Lies, but all of yes, them, everyone calls me Lies, so it's fine. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. So I guess you hear me. Yeah. Yes. All right, cool. Um, so in, in the context of this discussion, um, I, I was thinking that we all agree on the brain-inspired approach, but I think one of the questions we're all asking, whether implicitly or explicitly, is what is the right level of abstraction to get the best performance in what we do in terms of learning, in terms of efficiency, and I mean level of abstraction in the brain inspiration itself. And when I personally look into the recent advances, um, I see more and more people going deeper into biology and specifically using multi-compartment neurons, pyramidal neurons with dendritic compartments, and at the same time finding usefulness for implementing you know, useful things for training neural networks. And so my question is, uh, do you think that there will be a shift in uh, from using current based integrated fire neurons to using this multi-compartment uh, uh, neurons as maybe a basic block for computation in the neuromorphic community? Is there enough evidence to say that we should maybe switch to using, you know, this multi-compartment neurons as basic computational elements? And do you see it coming like, in, yeah, in the next year? Um, if anyone has a wants to start saying something about that, I, I actually have something I would say, but uh, maybe I'll give someone else an, an opportunity to talk before I get back in again. Just go ahead and start speaking. Sure. I'd say within one year, the sort of movement towards two compartments is is going to be stronger. I, I'm, a single compartment neuron doesn't really have the capability to integrate feedback and feed forward information streams, right? And there's some new, there's some new, there's some new stuff papers, like the stuff that um, Henning's working on that shows that the sort of multi compartments, even just two makes a really real difference in kind of multiplexing feed forward and feedback. And that, that means this can be done online rather than, rather than in a kind of uh, multi pass way. And I think that's, that's going to be a big, a big step forward when that can be done in a kind of computationally efficient sort of way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I probably um, I agree on that. And I'd say maybe what we're going to see is not necessarily that we'll start seeing like hugely biologically detailed multi-compartmental neurons with complex dendritic arbors or anything, but that we'll see some abstraction that is inspired by that um, becoming becoming more mainstream. What exactly that form will take, I don't know. Well, probably, totally, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think overall the, the neuronal complexity is something that hasn't been really tapped into. And I think we saw, just saw a nice talk by uh, Nicholas um, basically looking the first way into this direction um, for how can you actually, uh, how can this help computation? But there's a C period who had the hand up uh, for quite some time. I don't know with regards to which topic. So maybe yeah. chime in or ask a question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to comment on the five year like neuromorphic timeline. <laughs> Uh, basically, I think the, the biggest thing that will happen probably in the next five years is that there will be neuromorphic hardware that actually can compute also the gradients um, on chip. Um, and together with probably, I mean, if you look at Intel's timeline, uh, as opposed to what Jamie said, I think CMOS will rule and uh, and there, there's a good chance that you can maybe have an exponential increase in the number of neurons that you support. So even from Louis 1 to Louis 2, you had like, I think a factor of 10. 
And so this, this will go on like that. So you might have like a billion neurons in five years. And then I think the applications will follow with these two advances together. Well, I see Henning has his hand up. And, and since I, I have in mind that he's leaving in 10 minutes, I'll go give him an opportunity to skip the queue and say something more. Him. I have a comment and maybe also a question regarding the multi-compartment issue. And, and that's, I mean, given that I have used it myself, it's a little bit weird. Um, but I, my, I mean, we have played at times with just sort of optimizing spiking networks to do all sorts of tasks. And the problem that we had um, when we were not balancing E and I was that the behavior that came out, the, the solution that the system found was uh, pretty weird, right? And I don't know if that's, that's, that applies to, to you as well, if that's an experience that is just because we're, we're, we're starters on that front. But it's something where I just couldn't understand what that solution is. And it clearly didn't look like the brain. Right? So it did something. And so in that sense, my gut feeling was that I just don't understand what spiking networks do, that they're just very complicated and very rich in what they can do and how they solve problems. And so in that sense, if we have, so if I personally feel, I mean, and that's something where, I mean, I'm somebody who's less on the engineering side. I'm more on trying, I want to understand what's going on and why this is doing whatever it's doing. I always try to shy away a little bit more from additional complexity that I put in, other, unless I have an extremely good reason to do so, right? And, and that's why this, this sort of adding additional complexity, I'm wondering what your opinion on, 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 on that is, because it's clearly not going to make life easier, in understanding how they solve this, how these networks solve it. And it's not going to make it easier also to understand whether these solutions are robust, right? Or whether it's something that ends up breaking easily. And so I'll just throw it out there to see what your opinions are. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. And, and I also like, I, I never want to introduce complexity in or just because it's there, right? Like we shouldn't mimic all of the details that are in biology. We shouldn't be modeling down to like individual proteins and whatever sloshing around. Like that's that's too much probably. Um, well, I think for, from my point of view, like what we found with uh, in the work with Nicholas is basically like, if you do the sort of the, the minimum possible bit of introducing a bit more detail, it seemed to make a difference. Like where the boundary is, we, I don't think we, we don't we don't quite know where that boundary is, but at least it seems like it's introducing some detail is is mattering. I, I don't know if Nicholas wants to come in on, on that or or not, but at least for me, it feels like something matters, right? Like some of those details matter. Yeah, I mean, it's true that we also tried all the high parameters apart from the time constants and they didn't seem to influence that much the performance, but that may just be because because the way we were in this, the S1 or the initializations were in the best. So I, I'd say that some heterogeneity seems to, to matter for sure. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure if, if any heterogeneity would, would provide something. Yeah. Okay, Dominic, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you want to come in? Yes, hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to comment on the one year, five year time frame thing. But, um, First, I have to agree with Henning and with uh, Sandra that it's an exciting time that we have finally like the tool set to, to deal with spike neural networks, to train them, uh, train them. Although we're still kind of lacking the tools, like the software frameworks uh, and also the hardware to really get like the benefits out of the spiking systems that, that we all want to see. And like as maybe one thought in this direction or a question also to, to the others, um, because one big elephant in the room is still will like what will be the role of SNNs in the future? Like, will they replace ANNs? Will they form hybrid systems with ANNs? Will they have like a shine in completely different application areas, like where we need low energy, where we need low latency, um, and they will be the separate thing from uh, artificial neural networks? And I think that's still something that has to be clarified. And we now have kind of the, the tool set to do this, to see where are the differences and where are actually the similarities. But I would like to know what other people think about that. Before we get on to what anyone else thinks about that, Dominic, are we going to see spikes in European spaceships and space stations and stuff in the next five years? <laughs> oh, in the next five years? <laughs> uh, most likely not. Um, uh, that, that's exactly the thing that uh, like what we are interested in um, is figuring out 
whether like what is promised by SNNs can be used because in spaceships or like when you're in orbit and a satellite or so on, you do have very hard constraints on what kind of hardware you can use and what kind of algorithms you can use. Like you have, uh, of course, energy constraints since you only use solar cells, you have heat dissipation constraints since you're in a vacuum, um, you have the constraint of the bandwidth that you cannot send enormous amounts of data. So when you can reduce something very cheaply, for instance, with a spike neural network or neuro neuromorphic chip, that would be very helpful uh, and, and awesome to do. So I personally think that this is something like a, an exciting application area for this technology. But of course, it has to be proven. It has to be shown that when they put in a neuromorphic device or this algorithm, that it actually outperforms in important key metrics, uh, other approaches. And that's not just ANNs, but also other machine learning approaches like a random forest or a decision tree or anything else because they can also be very energy efficient. Um, so the vote for that is out there, but I would love to see that. Like the, the, the best replacement for human in space, I would say is something that is inspired by the human, so. <laughs> I guess probably also it's, it's going to be a bit slower there because they were going to want provable guarantees that things will work and, and anything machine learning, that's, that's probably a bit more difficult. Yes, definitely. Um, Ulysse, you've had your hand up for a little while. Do you want to, do you want to go ahead and bring in something? Yes, sure. Thanks. Uh, so, um, yes, w what I wanted to emphasize is the uh, interpretability of, uh, well, neural networks in, in general and not just uh, ANNs and uh, on, on this, I am joining um, so, uh, Henny. Um, I, I think what we lack actually uh, at the moment is uh, well, this interpretability. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about, of my, uh, about my, my talk, but uh, some information theor theory would be uh, so much beneficial to understanding uh, well, uh, how uh, uh, these uh, spiking representations uh, uh, can be more generalizable than uh, uh, well regular uh, floating point tensor uh, representations, and uh, also if, as for the and it's a shame because well most of us I believe and uh, well me including uh, and I, I would love to be uh, to to be able to do some information theory but uh, I, I don't think we are formed and uh, we, we, I I have I haven't done any studies about that so it's a bit of a, like it, it is lacking in, in, in our formation, in our knowledge, I think. And uh, so uh, as for the, um, the five year uh, timeline, um, I, I also definitely agree that the memory store is going uh, probably to be uh, uh, well, very uh, uh, promising. And uh, we could, I, I hope we, we could uh, have uh, uh, very complex models of neurons and integrating them in, uh, uh, at low cost uh, in, uh, in, in large scale simulations and um, in hardware. Uh, but uh, I, we could do hardware simulation. And I think that, that's going to be uh, uh, an important role to, to play uh, for neuroscience or for uh, well, in, in, in industrial applications. And uh, 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 <laughs> what to say? Uh, well, and uh, we, yeah, we are at the crossroad, and I really don't know uh, well, uh, if, uh, yeah, spiking neural networks are going to completely supplant, uh, uh, well, GPUs, etc. In the future, uh, well, no, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I jump in to offer a, a counterpoint from the hardware perspective? Uh, I. I Personally, uh, as a former computational neuroscientist and now working for a hot neuromorphic hardware startup, I was never convinced about the utility of neuromorphic hardware for computational neuroscience. Um, because you have infinite flexibility in software, um, you've got enormous GPU clusters now, anything you can express as linear algebra, you can just blast away. Um, I don't see how neuromorphic hardware is going to compete with them. Um, uh, GPUs for computational efficiency on, on linear algebra type problems anytime soon. So I have to say, I don't think the rise of neuromorphic hardware, which I hope is going to take off any moment, uh, is going to lead to any particular benefits for computational neuroscience. Okay. I well, don't thank think you, that's uh, it. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you for so much for your insight. Okay. Well, I, I was thinking about the, the problem of uh, memory when doing a backprop through, through time, for example. Uh, so 
uh, as for now, uh, so we, uh, so we, um, oh, sorry, maybe uh, I, took, uh, I answered directly. <laughs> sorry. No, oh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, no, no, that was, that was, that was absolutely fine. Yeah. Just yeah. Waving Henning. What are you? yeah, we were just waving, waving goodbye to Henning. Who was just okay. Sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, backprop full time is so much expensive in terms of memory, uh, even today. And I hope that uh, well, the progress in GPUs will enable uh, that. Uh, but uh, for the moment, uh, I, I hope, uh, and I, I'm much younger than most of you, so I, I don't know. <laughs> Chidi, you have much more experience than me about that. Uh, but uh, I hope that uh, hardware could uh, be useful in, in this sense. Uh, and also, why not? Uh, uh, I didn't mention that before, but why not uh, integrating biohybrid systems? So uh, uh, using uh, biological neurons uh, as a reservoir and uh, using artificial neurons uh, uh, for uh, as, a, as, as a readout. Mm -hmm. It could be a possibility as well. I'm just uh, throwing that uh, in the middle, but uh, yes. Uh, just from my perspective, uh, sorry, you know, go ahead, Fred. Yeah, I think I think one thing that we should emphasize is that maybe I tend to agree a little bit with Dion on that front, uh, that maybe the hardware won't really help us uh, necessarily now in the questions that we have in uh, competition or science, for instance, immediately. I do think, however, that this entire field will benefit tremendously from the fact that different people with different backgrounds are thinking about the same computational system or that simulating it on or running it on hardware, that's now a different question. But I think what was for me really enriching is actually to take a little bit um, the engineering perspective uh, and, and understand the problems there. And I think the type of meeting we're having here today, I, I find them uh, really great in that sense that we have these two communities coming together and that there is actually now a joint interest in, in making these things work. And one thing that you list mentioned, which I think is very important is understanding. And we should also not forget that that's something that's also vastly missing in deep learning, right? And the spiking network, they just add now another layer of complexity on top of a relatively simple, let's say, convolutional network, which already produces very complex uh, representations. So it's a problem, I think, that will require uh, diverse approaches and an interdisciplinary mindset, actually, from many people to think about. It's a hard problem. And uh, I think uh, that's exactly what we should aspire to. So I uh, shut up now. I, I see that Thomas and uh, Christian, they all, um, and Jamie also, they all and actually raised their hand. Yeah, let's let's hear from Thomas in one sec. I just wanted to add one thing to what Dylan said as well, which is, um, yeah, I agree. I don't see it being important right now, um, but we're already running up against the limits of what we can do easily on GPUs. Like for, for our paper with Nicholas, we computed that we used two years of GPU time to produce that study. Like um, that's that's too much. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and, and we were doing things with a hundred neurons, like, you know, that's so two years of GPU time for some, for something there. We're just investigating what a hundred neurons can do is, 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 is excessive. So maybe it, it will make a difference. Soon. Uh, yeah. I anyway, know. Sorry, Thomas, go ahead. Yeah. I want to comment on the same, same issue actually, but, but maybe a slightly different angle. I think in with Dylan that, um, for computational neuroscience especially, but generally for research, there is always a, a real obstacle in using the hardware because you might want to investigate something that the hardware designer hasn't thought of. And it unfortunately happens really, really often that, that there's this one detail you wanted to do and it's not there. And as, as Dylan said, in software, you have the flexibility, you can do whatever you want. Um, that being said, I think once we're getting more close to something that's an application, that's where I hope the hardware will come in. In, in five years' time, I would hope there is something where some people have settled on what they want to do, and it will come out in hardware, and it will be a product, and, and this stuff will start to permeate, and then will be picked up. And of course, once the funding comes in, a lot more will happen. It will get cheaper, it will get bigger, uh, and so on, and so on. And I, I do think there is now a chance that this is happening. So I'm, I'm quite positive on that side, but I don't think it will then accelerate the research much because it will always be this mismatch of uh, you know doing something new on hardware that was made for a specific purpose. It will never be, I don't think it will ever be really multi, multi or general purpose in that sense. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a question that came up in the chat just in case not everyone is, is looking at it. So Marcus said, 
Everyone seems excited about having larger networks, but from a neuroscience perspective, what questions are only addressable in larger networks? Uh, and I think that's, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to comment on that directly, but I think that's a, a question worth thinking about. So um, do put your hand up if you've got a point of view on that. Uh, Jamie, do you, do you want to say something? Uh, my point was on? not addressing this, but so I, we were talked earlier about complexity. And I think from an engineering point of view, um, neuron complexity is one thing, but synaptic complexity is, is another. So I, while I entirely, I'm first to be clear, I'm unlike Dylan and, and Christian, I'm not a real hardware person. I'm kind of a half fake hardware person. But while we could probably build billions of billions of synapses, bil sorry, billions of neurons in, in CMOS, I think building a corresponding useful number of synapses to represent general problems in CMOS would be extremely difficult. Um, Dylan's nodding, which makes me feel confident I'm not talking absolute shit. Um, and that's where I think, uh, that's where I think uh, memoristers and something like that are going to be vital. But um, more on a more theoretical basis, like um, in Friedman's recent paper, they showed that this you can if you have more neuronal complexity. And I think also the the heterogeneous delays uh, um, in the, from the last the last talk today, they both showed that if you add just a small amount more neuronal complexity, then you can potentially you potentially start learning using much simpler much simpler learning rules. So Sort of online learning rather than backprop through time, and I don't I don't think there's any way to scale backprop through time. However many GPUs you have, unless you however many GPUs you have, I don't think you can scale backprop through time for large problems or long or anything that requires a lot of time steps. So I think that um, for me, I think that's neuronal complexity is offers a kind of an attractive solution to some of these problems. Cool. Um, Christian, I see you've had your hand up for a while, but Tim has not yet spoken and just put his hand up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let him jump jump the queue on that one. Tim, do you want to say something? Thank you, Dan. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yep. About Matthew's question, like from a neuroscience perspective, what questions do you think are only addressable in larger networks? I think um, we, we need to move the, from the neuroscience community. We need to move from you know toy tasks uh, models that that can solve uh, toy what what I call toy tasks. And if you want to, to solve a real world problem, which our brain does, like, you know, complex object recognition to, to just to name it, you, you have to do something like ImageNet classification. And this is this you can only do it with a large network. So if you want to build a, a, a realistic model of the visual system, uh, which, the, which can do stuff like uh, ImageNet classification, the human visual system, then you need a large network. I mean, there is no way you can use a toy model to do that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely, I, I would like to really like strongly, strongly agree with that point. I think for, for me, like throughout my my neuroscience career, that's been the, the weird thing about being in neuroscience is we study the most complex, like intelligent information processing system in, 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 in the known universe. Uh, and we study it doing simple tasks like press a left or a right button if you hear a beep or not, you know, it's like... Yeah. We're not looking at it in the right way. We need to be looking at the brain solving difficult tasks, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why this, like the, the machine learning, like sort of revolution of recent years, and particularly doing that with spiking neurons, is, is exciting. I think. Um, Christian, do, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I, I just <laughs> I have to disagree with Jamie again, uh, and also like one of the previous speakers that backpropagation through time can't be scaled because I think actually this is one of the key things that spiking neurons have an advantage over um, recurrent, like general recurrent neural networks, because you, at least for linear dynamics, you are not required to um, keep a memory trace of the whole um, like forward pass to compute the backward pass. And this has been shown by me and Timo Wunderlich and also by Comsa et al. and uh, um, Julian Goltz in like, in like special cases. So I think this is really, um, and it, it's it's a completely general thing, a property of spiking neural networks. So I think that is really a huge advantage compared to arbitrary recurrent neural networks. And um, if you combine that with a hardware implementation, I think that could really be the thing uh, that uh, that allows you to scale back propagation through time. Oh, uh, ah, yeah, and also there's also the uh, work by uh, by one of your students, Dan, right, where you show something similar for uh, surrogate gradients that you can kind of truncate the amount of memory. Yeah, that that's right. Have. In fact, actually, that's by Nicholas as well. But uh, I mean, 
we, we gain a bit from that, but not enough to scale up to like millions of neurons or anything like that. Like, <laughs> so to to be clear, when I was talking about backprop through time, I was not talking about um, backpropagating spike times like you were talking about, Christian. Clearly, that scales in a much better better way. I was talking about backprop through time in the in the kind of more, I guess, the more classic sense where you you are storing the state every time step. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, Matteo, you 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 haven't spoken yet. Do you wanna do you wanna come in and say something? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, actually, I would like to thank you all the organizers for this because it's already super super interesting the discussion and everything. So thank you for the conference, the workshop. But actually, I was I, I was related to what the Mar Marcus question before and also Timothy's comment, and I wanted to make this point that so. Given that we all more or less we thought we work with spike and neural networks, we think that spikes are important, right? But I think that related to the usefulness of large-scale models, for instance, I work in a little bit in between between neuroscience and machine learning, and I work also with data. We have a lab here. We work with mice, and I mean, if you look at the data spikes, that it's sometimes it's really a mess to understand. What, what is happening, which, why which one spike would be the, uh, important or not important. Usually people just look at fighting rate codes, right? Rate coding and stuff. And I think that one way, I don't know if anybody ever looked at it or I wanted to hear something some, from you people, if that you think it would be useful to use large scale model of spike in neural networks is to test our methods that we use in neuroscience. Because sometimes when we look at the spikes, spike raster plots and whatever, we don't really know what it's happening. And we have, we use models that they can add indeed, again, they, they are based on rate coding, or we look for coherence, we look for spike field coherence, but we don't know what it's happening because we don't know exactly what the brain is really doing in that moment. But if we train neural networks, spike in neural networks, a large scale model on something, and we know that it's actually good on that, let's say vision, then we can, I think one way, one good idea would be to, apply our methods there and see what happens. What, what are the spike rasters that this network is, is he, he, what the network learn to be, how the network learn to behave in order to solve that task. And I, this could be useful for us to check if our method is actually useful to ask our, to answer our questions, or I don't know if we would look some for something else. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, that was just a, a follow up and, plus a question if you think that this could be a useful idea or if you know anything that could be related to that or something. Oh, I think that's a, that's a really nice question. I think actually at some point I asked one of my PhD students if he wanted to, uh, to do that and, and never got around to it. It's actually a little bit related to when Marcus, Marcus asked his questions, he said, uh, is, is, more re is more data really enough thinking about Conrad Cording's microprocessor paper? And I think it's a bit like that. Like, so that paper is, could a neuroscientist understand uh, a microprocessor? And basically, they had to go at like applying neuroscience methods to try and understand what a microprocessor would do, and, and indeed doesn't really help very much. So we could do the more sophisticated version of that now. Like, can neuroscience methods understand something that's directly supposed to be a model of the brain, where we where we kind of know what's going on? So I think that would be a really cool study to do. Uh, please, somebody do it because it looks like I don't have the bandwidth to do. Yeah, it. But also because if you look at like the Carlos James De Carlos lab, they really there are people that they really look at the convolutional neural networks and they. They think that this could be it, it's our our best model of the visual system in that case, right? So far, but mm -hmm. there's no spike there, not even one. It yeah. could be a useful idea to try to so, do something similar in a sense, but with spike in your networks at least. Yeah, I think your question is basically one of the things uh, that would be my answer to what is what I would like to see next year. Um, that this is being done, and uh, we're, we're also working on this, but we're just slow, and that uh, would be great <laughs> more support us in the community. But I think a lot of people are thinking about it, and it's, of course, an indirect way of figuring things out, but maybe it's always a bit of an answer to, to the question about why do we want big networks, because I think then you um, had this inflammatory um, <laughs> question earlier about, I think this to Henning, whether he agreed with this kind of... Um, Conrad Cording is also an author on that paper, like Richards et al. Um, with this approach that you should basically think about uh, learning rules, uh, loss functions, and the architectures instead of really trying to figure out what every single neuron is doing individually. And I think it ties nicely into Matteo's question now um, that this might be an alternative approach to deal 
with this extended complexity. Um, and that, of course, now opens, um, yeah, the, the, doing this with spiking networks opens, uh, I think, plenty of new avenues. Um, and one additional thing that I want to say why, why it's um, important to look at large networks, and that's scaling. I think that's really something that machine learning has taught us that the, to, to get a convolutional network, network, also like the Decala ones, to, to work, you need an efficient training algorithm. And you need many neurons uh, for it to actually solve uh, the problem. But importantly, also the training algorithm needs to be very efficient. Yeah? So and if you take this idea from, the, from this uh, neuro, uh, deep learning approach to neuroscience paper seriously, then you should also think about how does the brain set up the required complexity? So how does the brain learn or how does the genetic algorithm set up the inductive biases in such a way that it actually wires up um, effectively? And these algorithms need to be scalable. Yeah? So the, so we have this, um, this uh, reinforce algorithm, which can provably for infinite data and infinite time solve every problem and approximate the gradient well, but they don't work well. They work well on, on, on small networks with a couple of hundred neurons, but not on bigger networks. And I think that's really something that the neuroscience community has to still get used to, but that sometimes scaling is a very important issue in the brain. At least the primate brains know very well how to solve it at every level, the architecture and the learning and everywhere. Cool. Uh, Dominic, you've had your hand up for a little while. Do you want to come in? Yes, I also wanted to comment on the, uh, 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 how large the networks have to be uh, thing. Like, because like currently, at least when we talk about functional spiking neural networks, I wouldn't even say that they have to be large. They're currently like super small. Like compared to a mouse brain, it's, it's like ridiculously small. It's a few 100, 100 neurons. And even to do like more interesting tasks like ImageNet, if we can scale it up to a few thousands, that's that's still very small, but it would already be large enough. So I wouldn't say it has to be like it's not large enough. It's it's much too small, I would say, currently networks. And also, I really like the the point that was made uh, right now about um because um how to say. Like one thing that's still kind of a mystery, of course, is how like spiking neural networks, especially in the brain, are used or like encode information efficiently. And when you can scale up your networks to more interesting tasks, onto also more diverse tasks, and train it on on different things, on different cost functions with different architectures. Like for instance, like I did for the for the graph embedding thing, um, but also what everyone is currently doing with the surrogate gradient approach, that you just automatically find the correct temporal structures in your spiking neural networks and you can you can look at it and see okay what does my net network actually doing how many spikes is it producing how is it encoding this information i think this is very interesting because in a wet lab this is hard to do but in a computer you can just rerun the experiment you can look at the data you can tweak with it you can change things you can try to understand it and maybe you're not all the time studying the brain um, but you're going through all the steps to understand how the computation is done. And I think spiking neural networks can help there a lot, as, as well as also making models more complex and adding like, compartments and stuff like this, and going more into the direction of neuroscience. Cool. Dylan? Yeah, I had a couple of related points about adding complexity and, and scaling up uh, uh, model sizes. Um, from a neuroscience perspective, I, I think the issue becomes one of, of reduced constraints. So you're just massively under constrained as you scale your, your models up. And uh, the solution that we're sort of discussing around in this workshop is, is then using uh, automated training, supervised training mechanisms with some objective function to, to give us back some constraints to find a good solution through this, through this tangled forest of, of unconstrained neurons. Um, but I don't have a great deal of faith in the optimizers uh, that, that come out of deep neural networks in general. I, I think they're generally pretty crap. Gradient descent, gradient descent is generally pretty crap. And it only, it's only useful when you actually don't know what to do. So if you don't know what to do, let's, let's descend some gradients and we get something that works well. But it's still very unconstrained and you move very, you don't move very far away from your initialization point. So, my point is that if you scale the model up hugely and you want to try and learn something about uh, biological neural networks, 
um, unless you happen to initialize close to the actual solution and you happen to hit on your optimization loss functions that, uh, that, that just get it exactly right, I think you're going to find some solution, but which may, I, I don't have faith that it will have any strong link to the, the biological reality. And this becomes worse as you, as you scale up in complexity. Sorry to bring down the room. <laughs> Um, okay, so nobody's got their hands raised at the moment. Does anyone want to pipe in on any of these things or perhaps we could move on to a slightly different topic? Nope. Um, okay, so we had a couple of different things that we were thinking about um, discussing as part of this. Um, I'm kind of interested if people think, what, what does everyone think is the time scale for how long until SNNs are sort of in some way a competitive alternative to ANNs and when we'll, when we'll see sort of commercial applications of them sort of becoming reasonably widespread. Um, I, I guess Dylan would be a sensible person to do that, to, to, to start talking about that given that he's working on exactly that. Um, yeah, I, I I'm sick of having my hand up all the time, but uh, yeah, so commercial applications, um, hopefully within 12 months, uh, we'll see the first small scale commercial applications, but these aren't going to look like computational neuroscience anything. These are really going to be um, very small scale tasks that will look very much like toy tasks that will be using very small networks. Um, our approach is, is very close to the sensor, so very low level sensory processing. This is the sorts of things which we think are achievable on a, on a short term basis. Mm. In terms of competitive, in terms of performance, that's a very deep and thorny question because it depends on how you measure performance, right? If you if you're gonna if you only care about accuracy and you want to constrain, you've got the same number of neurons, you're always going to lose because you've got you've got much better resolution on state, for example, in an ANN. So you've got actually much more information in an ANN with the same number of neurons. Uh, as with a spiking network, uh, also in terms of communication. So you, you, it's a very thorny question. And, and if you constrain the question down to, uh, you've got to have real-time latency, you've got to be operating at 500 microwatts, um, you've, got to be, you've got to sell it for less than $2, then, then you start to see a, a huge benefit. Um, Katie, you, you briefly had your hand up. Did you want to come back on that or...? No, I was agreeing completely. I think very, very small networks that aren't necessarily biologically plausible for certain tasks are where the first commercial play is going to be. Um, and I think that performance is absolutely, defining what we mean by performance is absolutely the right, um, right question to ask for where in the very short term neuromorphic is going to have a play. I mean, we've had a lot of success. There's been some discussion in the chat with networks that are smaller than 100 neurons on on things like control tasks and sensor sensor data analysis. So you can do a lot with very small networks. It might not be sort of biologically plausible what you're doing, but they're still computationally powerful. I mean, there, there are actually already some commercial applications out there, right? Like Azukevich's company is doing some spiking neural network stuff, right? Or I don't, I don't really know what the current state of any of uh, of, well, any of these uh, is. I think they gave up with the spikes. I mean, the, oh, they gave up with the spikes? Yeah, yeah, they did. As far as I know. Okay. I mean, uh, does anyone know of any like, actual devices out there that are using spikes in 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 use today? Dylan probably knows more than he says. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, in terms of a, a commercial consumer product that you can buy, um, there used to be this Samsung in-home monitoring camera that used a DVS uh, that was sold last year. I don't think they're selling this anymore. Um, I am not aware of, of anything else, really. But I, th I thought DVS cameras would be the, the obvious one, you know, where it's spiking. Of course, it's, it, in a sense, it's just sensory, but, but anyway, it, it's still a spiking application. And I thought there was some, some real um, commercial interest in, the, in, in terms of satellite spotting and things like that with DVS cameras. And that was semi-commercial or, or even commercial at this point. But I don't have the details, so so maybe it's just TSA. Sorry, <laughs> Tim. Didn't didn't Simon Thorpe have a have a company doing spiking something that was a bit related to what you were doing? 
Yes, 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 he did. And I, actually, it's been bought by Brainchip, uh, which uh, which Ulis mentioned. It's it's actually a, um, a neuromorphic chip. But as far as I know, they don't, they don't have applications yet. I mean, not not a, not a commercial product, not a mature commercial product. Mm. Okay. Jamie, you had your hand up for a little while? You, you, you know. Yeah, I was basically going to agree. I think I, I can entirely believe that within one year, <clears throat> there'll be some neuromorphic edge computing device in some in some like niche application where low power low power is required, low latency is required, that type of thing. Um, I don't imagine it would be have any any training. I suspect it would become some kind of obstacle flow, DVS, sensory type thing. Um, but I was going to say, I, I think it depends It depends what, how you define better performance. As a slight spoiler for my talk today, tomorrow rather, um, I, I show that it's in some, in some sort of relatively small tasks on normal GPU hardware, uh, SNNs can be faster for inference than LSTMs. So, I mean, if you de depending on how you define performance, um, SNNs are already better. Right? But it's not. But it's a complex, complex business, as Dylan says. Cool. All right. Looking forward to that. Okay, we should probably begin to wrap up soon. But I want to finish on a slightly more controversial um, fi final question. So, um, what do you think? Do you think that the uh, the biggest payoff in the sort of current revolution, I would say, of what's going on in spiking neural networks is going to be in terms of applications, be they commercial or whatever, or in terms of understanding the brain. Um, and yeah, okay. Does it? Does anyone have a have an opinion on that? Sandra, do you do you want to say something? You haven't said much lately. <laughs> yeah, so I I know where that that people are at least have prototypes of applications that make a lot of sense when you once you optimize your sensor acquisition it seems to be super competitive uh, we collaborate with iMac and, and they have build a lift chip uh, that that kind of thing should ta really take off and and I think half my group is working on biologically plausible deep learning and we sort of abandoned the spike endurance to be honest because uh, I think Jamie said it with 32 bits of information flowing between our artificial neurons I mean, we, we sort of have a super brain and, and we still want to resolve how the cognitive tasks happen in those kind of networks. We could probably turn it into spiking neurons later. Turns out to be a headache every time, by the way. Uh, spiking neurons make life a lot harder. But, but just solving cognitive tasks with artificial neural networks seems a big, big order for the, for the next couple of years anyway. So, so if you're asking who's going to have the biggest impact, I'm, I think it will be applications because... They're sort of really on the up curve. Uh, I hope, of course, we, we get lots of spiking cognitive science done too, but it's going to be more difficult. Uh, anyone else want to pipe in on that? Friedman, what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, uh, I think it's really on the up curve on both fronts. Um, I agree totally with Sander that uh, we kind of um, we don't necessarily need the spikes to understand many things uh, in neurobiology. I think there is a lot of things to be learned about the, the neuronal dynamics, which you can also simulate without, without the spikes. I think the interesting aspect is really the, the comparison to real data. There, I think the spikes will be handy. That's something that Matteo also um, mentioned earlier. And I think that's uh, going to be an intrinsic part of the understanding ultimately. So fixing the architecture to be as close as possible in the model to, to the real thing, and then using on top of this, this training methods um, that allow us to, um, to get the function into the network and then comparing this um, to, to the biological ground truth and understanding whether uh, they seem to be using similar strategies. We know from work by Surya Ganguly and Miro Mahanas Varanathan, for instance, that the architecture um, plays a huge role in how neural networks represent information internally. And all these decolor approaches, they basically also uh, capture only 40 or 50% or of the variance now in the visual stream. So I, I'm kind of hopeful that we can get uh, much better if we align the architectures much closer to what's actually used in the brain. Um, what's going to happen first, I don't know. Uh, I kind of uh, hope that this hardware um, business will, will take off and that we see applications soon. I think it's just something that gives me joy seeing a spiking neural network work. 
uh, whether it's an artificial one or, the, or a real one. Um, but I don't have a guess um, on, uh, on which one is going to come first. But I think one thing that will inevitably influence also deep learning uh, in the future heavily, whether it's with spikes or not, and that's, I think, the difference to what Sandra just said. Right now, we're simulating this uh, with a with 32 bit value. So, why use a spike? I think sparseness is going to come back, irrespectively, um, both at the connectivity level and also the activation level. Um, and that's also something that's happening now in deep learning, for which the accelerators, um, the existing accelerators, are more and more suited. And I think that's coming back to Sim's question uh, in the very beginning, like uh, that he uh, said, why this losing of spikes isn't, isn't a problem? It's, a, it's not a bug, it's a feature. And I totally agree with him there. Um, we, we are interested intrinsically in neural networks that can do complicated computation with very little communication. And, and I think there, Neurons, um, whichever they look like, uh, they might be able to uh, cater to both worlds by having intrinsic internal dynamics uh, like a real neuron uh, and combine this with um, somehow sparse communications uh, in many places. And I think that's uh, something which would presumably create a new phase, uh, a new field of interface between these disciplines, because then you get an entire spectrum of models um, between binary spiking, noise spiking. Um, and I think we'll shed profound insights into how neural networks compute both artificial and biological. I think this, the sparseness yeah. point is, is really interesting. And actually there's, uh, there's an annual workshop on sparseness in ML that we should probably all be paying careful attention to. I think they invited Friedman to speak actually at their most recent one. So they're also uh, paying attention to what we're doing, I guess. Uh, but yeah, no, good, a good one to watch, I think. Cool. Um, if anyone else wants to speak, go ahead. Otherwise, I think we'll begin to, to start to wrap up for the day. Well, I, yeah, I, I can offer. Very, very briefly, uh, if I may, I, I think that the sparseness point is really important and this will play a role in the future. But to state the obvious, I mean, if you want to be sparse, you also need to be large, right? So that we kind of connecting the dots again with like, why do we need large? If you, if you want to work with very sparse codes and things, you can't do that in a very small network because you don't, obviously you, you just don't have anything left. So I think this might come back where, um, where we need large networks because it's the, it's the kind of sparse code that work, works well and the, you know, the sparse connections and so on. And someone else was also speaking? I, I, I don't yeah, know was. Uh, I was, uh, yeah. Just going to add that um, as far as uh, spiking networks as a future technology, it would be great. So a lot of the talk seems to be about low power, uh, which it doesn't seem like the most interesting feature of spiking networks. Um, but it seems like you know there's a potential future where uh, there, you know, a spiking network could be a different type of computational engine uh, that sort of emphasizes the, the way that spiking networks work is different from how uh, things like backprop and deep learning work, uh, particularly emphasizing. Uh, dynamics and feedback and the fact that you've got separated inhibitory and excitatory neurons. Um, and that if we can find applications that emphasize those particular properties of spiking networks, uh, for example, um, let's say decomposing a visual, um, you know, for visual processing, decomposing the scene into sort of elements that are, have, you know, time offsets where timing matters and the top-down feedback is integrated with bottom-up. So you're actually getting network dynamics that converge on an explanation for the scene. Um, you know, solving that kind of convergence constraint satisfaction problem in a way that emphasizes the dynamics would be something unique to what spiking neurons can do. Obviously, a lot of hard problems to solve to get that to work. But it sends then spiking neurons and spiking networks become a different sort of engine, um, and then it becomes really interesting commercially. Okay, well, I think uh, it sounds like we're, we're we're good to to wrap up at that point. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, everyone. This has been a, a, a great fun. Uh... Oh, actually, hang on. Wait, what have we got? Oh no, that's clapping. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, this has been a. It's been a really fun uh, discussion. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking part. And uh, yeah, looking forward to to seeing you all at the talks and the posters uh, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.